Hey everybody, we got a special edition today. Usually I'm the one interviewed, the one who get, gives the quotes. Today, however, I'm the interviewer and my special guest is Bob Powell. He's the editor of Retirement Daily, which is part of thestreet.com. You can see his articles on USA Today, among many other places in the media. He's been good enough to support me and maximize your Medicare since the beginning. Here's a good, our, our conversation. We covered a range of topics, not only about himself, but we've also talked about GameStop, of course, and we're almost obligated to. And since he's from Massachusetts, we talk about my man, Tom Brady. Hope you enjoy. So today, something new and different. I'm turning the tables, not completely upside down, certainly, but at least turning them around a little bit. I'm usually the interviewer, and my distinguished guest is Bob Powell, who is a very experienced, highly acclaimed uh, you know, retirement editor, journalist, long list. Bob, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. It's too long to read here, but <laughs> let's just call it for the moment your current roles. You're the editor of Retirement Daily, which is part of thestreet.com. Uh, you know, kind, amongst many other things, your writings, USA Today and many other locations. Thank you so much for, you know, including me in your effort. Thank you and welcome to the podcast. Yeah, Jay, it's a pleasure to be here with you and have the tables turned. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So I'm calling you where? You're in Massachusetts, is that right? I'm in Massachusetts, about 10 miles north of uh, Boston, yeah. And so, that's where you've been for this whole time or for the majority of your adult life? I, uh, my wife and I moved here in the early, oh God, we've been here. We're interlopers, quite frankly, <laughs> but we moved here in the early 1990s, 1990. Yeah. So does that mean that you're... Let me ask you, since you're in Massachusetts, you got to ask. So are you in the camp of you want to see the Tampa Bay Buccaneers win or you're in the camp of, well, this is all Belichick's, you know, doing so, you know, screw you, Tom. Uh, so that's a really tough question. Right? <laughs> it's, it's hard to live in New England and not be a Patriots fan, not support Tom Brady, not support Belichick through right and wrong. Right, right. Um, but but I'm in a pool. And the odds of winning, if I bet on Brady, are against me. So I have to bet on Kansas City in the pool, but I may be rooting for Tom. So I have mixed you're... emotions, Jay. It's a really <laughs> tough question uh, uh, because I think, you know, when he left the Patriots, um, he left a team where he didn't have the weapons to do what he wanted to do. Oh, clear. Very right. clear. So, I partly blame Belichick for that and kudos to Brady for landing in a spot where he had all the things that he wanted, wide receivers, tight ends, blocking, running backs. I mean, it was a really, and a great coach and great, great coaching. So good, kudos it, to him. Well, I'm, I'm clearly the bias, right? Cause he went to the university of Michigan. So I've known, you know, about Tom Brady since he, you know, he wasn't, he couldn't get on the field even in Ann Arbor that, you know, he was the backup to Drew Henson, who was supposed to be, you know, you know, the cat's meow. Yeah. And so he was at, he's been, a, he's been fighting uphill this entire time, you know, that and the, of course, the famous, you know, whatever, fifth or sixth round draft pick and the whole thing. So always had this, you know, very large chip on his shoulder. I think though, that uh, he might, he might be over it. <laughs> I think he's over it. And, and now there's there's something else that he's striving for, I think, which is, you know, right, to be truly to never be challenged as the greatest of all time. Right. I, I, I think it's already over. I mean, the, the candid. I mean, somebody was saying you could what split is you could split his career into three and each of the three would be a Hall of Fame career. Yeah, it's remarkable right now that now that he's in the Super Bowl, he will be in what, 19 percent of all Super Bowls it's, ever it's, played or something. something like it's just absolutely absolutely insane yeah so you've been you've caught this whole boston sports ride until well i guess this last year hasn't been very good lost brady lost mookie 
that's not a very good uh, lost to Dana Chara. Yeah, we we're uh, yeah we uh, we lost Kyrie Irving, but I don't think that was a big loss to us. <laughs> <laughs> that that still gets to be yet to be played out. That it is, uh, but yeah, we had a good run. I mean, going back to the I guess uh, Red Sox in two thousand four, and uh, the Bruins had a championship. The Celtics had a championship. Oh, the it's thing. In, absolutely crazy. Bostonians have no, no, nothing to complain about. I unfortunately have the you know disgrace of be or burden. I've been a lifelong Cowboys fan, oh. <laughs> so it's, it's been a long, it's been a long while. And the weirdest thing is, you know, I come into a group of all sorts of circle. I've never told you the story. Is that a client of mine out of the Dallas area? We were commiserating. And it comes out, she's the close friend of Two Tall Jones. Oh, really? <laughs> so, so I thought you were the coolest of my, all of my contacts, Bob, but I, sorry. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I will gladly cede that position. <laughs> That's great. But of course, those were the glory days, right? Yeah, those are the glory days. Absolutely. Long, long gone, you know, unfortunately. So yeah. we thought that 2021 was... You know, at least it's not 2020, but it's not really started. <laughs> no, I feel like we're running in place a little bit, but uh, maybe we're making a little forward progress. Are you getting much, you know, over this past week? You know, you're sitting in a, in a spot where you're largely working on retirement topics. But even then, you know, you can't be completely blind and, you know, every podcast and YouTube video in the, on the planet, doesn't matter what the topic is, is calling up GameStop. So what do you make of this whole thing as far as, you know, from your perspective, as far as, are you getting questions and things like that? Yeah, we're getting questions. We One of the features that we run in Retirement Daily is something called Ask the Hammer, where I talk with uh, uh, Jeffrey Levine from Buckingham uh, Wealth Partners. And a reader question came in about, GameStop and uh, whether they should buy it and what's a short squeeze. So there's definitely some, it's really raised. I mean, I think it was there prior to GameStop, right? I, I look at the, I call it the Robin Hood generation. These sure. are like my, my ch I have uh, uh, children ages uh, 25 and 22 and right. uh, they all have Robin Hood accounts and they're always uh, buying a share of this and two shares of that and, uh, and asking me what I think about this. And uh, they were late to the party on GameStop. I, I must admit, they, they called me after it had risen by a lot to wonder what was going on. And I think what's interesting about it is, right, this is a, a case of, I mean, certainly like people are calling it the David and Goliath kind of story. And in a way, it is that. But, but it's also I, a story that I don't think ends well for most of the people who bought GameStop. Now, it's not over yet. Right. But I, I think what happens is this stock is grossly overvalued at right. this point relative to sales and earnings and and whatnot and and um and i don't see what the play is here and so when when it starts to fall and it will and people start rushing for the exit door well only one person can get through that door at a time and that's going to leave a lot of people uh, uh wishing that they had sold a day prior when this thing starts to plummet and when uh, the music stops it's going to be interesting to see because we've got all this uproar about you know robin should robin hood shouldn't be restricting you know, access to certain shares of certain companies, et cetera, et cetera. And they closed it down and they turned it back on. And it's going to be the uproar on the other end when, you know, hopefully private investors don't get too hurt. But there's a, there's a buyer when someone was selling, you know, at 300 something. And right. And that, and that buyer was a hedge fund that had to cover its position on the way down there. There may not be anyone there on the other side. And so it may fall a lot. And I, and I look at this, you know, it's an interesting story because I think if you say, OK, as a as a investment strategy, buying stocks and companies where there's a high short interest is an interesting play. And now we've witnessed the power of of a Reddit platform, of a an army of people who buy into a storyline, whether it's AMC or Nokia or, you know, name the stock. Blackberry. Right. And, and all of a sudden it creates this stampede. And then um, 
they're over. It's a movement, right? I mean, people kept saying, resist the hedge funds, keep buying, right? As, but, but without any basis for buying it. I mean, right, this would, if you were a fan of um, Warren Buffett, you would be horrified. If you were a fan of, you know, uh, of Graham and Dodd, you'd be horrified by this. It's not anything I would ever advocate for, that's for sure. I mean, investing in short interest stocks, sure. But this kind of fever, not so much. <laughs> And investing in short interest stocks is not anything new, right? I mean, you know, you and I think I saw some research the other day that, you know, the the Russell, you know, has largely been driven by a very small subset of of shares that you know had you know not coincidentally huge short interest, and you know that has you know outperformed, you know, Nasdaq and S and P five hundred over the past quarter certainly, you know, by pretty notable difference. I mean, meaningful difference, you know, one that, so it's going to be interesting. The other thing I was thinking, do you, have you been looking at Wall Street Bets, you know, which is the Reddit sub, the sub, the platform and things like that? For me, what I said, what struck me is that, you know, the, the conversations that I see on these Reddit platforms, you know, because people are going in there without their full name that the informa- some of the information and some of the posts, rather than just the normal cheerleading and you know, diamond hands or whatever you know, <laughs> slogans that people are using, that is the data and jargon and information not used by everyday people. In other words, you know, that, that is someone with an options book or options information, right? I mean, people now know what gamma hedging is, you know, and things like that. Yeah. But some of the other posts that I've noticed on these, on these sites are not actually, you know, there's no way they could have invented that language. You see what I'm saying? In other words, somebody in, in there is in fact a professional who's actually in there, you know, contributing. Yeah, well, for better you know, or for there was a, I don't know if you saw it, Jay, there was a great story in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend about the guy who is credited with creating the GameStop frenzy. And he's a, a fairly young guy who has a CFA, a Chartered Financial right. Analyst designation, right. Right. and and has been doing this kind of, and he, and he had worked up until recently at Mass Mutual, uh, you know, a financial services company. And right. he has a YouTube channel. And, you know, he was, a, he's a, I would describe him as a serious investor. He, he right, sure. knew what he was doing. And you're right. I think there are other people in there that are, that do know what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder about the degree to which, I mean, like if you worked at a mutual fund company or even an investment newsletter, right, you can't front run a stock, right, that you own. But that's seemingly what is occurring to me here too, is that we've got a lot of uh, front running going on, right? Where people own the stock and then start touting it. Now, I, 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 I'm willing to bet that the SEC can't prosecute anyone in, in or maybe they can. I don't know. It's going to be. I, I don't know. Plays out. I, I, it's a, it's an interesting thing, you know. Be, and it's peculiar because you see on in the media, in on TV, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I'm not sure how. Maybe you can give me some insight. The average person watching the TV clip may or may not understand the fact that the mutual fund manager or whatever investment strategy person, point person, you know, is talking about, you know, their own internal position, you know, and, and there though, that they, they know that they're regulated. You right. see what I'm saying? I mean, they yeah. know full, they know, you know, the light turns on, they don't just get to start, you know, blabbering away. Yeah. And, and yet here on these Reddit boards, that. Jay was uh, like, people are posting their account statements, right? Which I find really fascinating. Uh, so, you know, on, on the one hand, okay, maybe it's real. Uh, two, it's it's a paper profit at the moment, right? It's it's only a profit really until you sell it. So, uh, you know, I'd be curious to see what their account statements look like after they sell it. That's one. And two, not that you want to say this is a reason or not to get involved in this sort of thing, but the taxable, mm. uh, the taxes on a short-term capital mm. gain like that will be- Oh, yeah. Out. Uh, not insignificant. Oh, it's going to be big. And whether or not everyone knows exactly how much that is and how it gets calculated and that kind of thing is a whole different thing where, you know, the ripple effects are not known. I think it'll be interesting to see because on one hand, you've got this movement where you've got, you know, Main Street versus Wall Street, but yet Main Street 
through their 401k, their IRA, et cetera, et cetera, that if the short sellers are covering, and then if, I mean, they can just cover just by buying back. The other way is, you know, they could just post the collateral, but right. in order to post the collateral, they'll be selling the winners. And in order, to, selling the winners means selling Apple or and not Apple specifically. Right. But, you right. know, you're just talking about ones which have, you know, the NASDAQ, which has, you know, yep. been on a tremendous run on a multi-year run here. So now did everybody actually understand that that's the ripple effect that could, you know, if it continues to leak yeah. into other, they think, oh, well, I'm immune from GameStop or the whole dynamic. Maybe, <laughs> right? If, unless it gets too big, it's, it's fine in some little corner of the universe where someone's short covering some $400 million company and that's it. And that it's just the isolated incident. But you're talking about a bigger scale now you're talking about leaking into the big indexes that everyone's allocating, you know, large amounts of capital. That will be interesting to see. And I don't think we know yet. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, we, we, we have a way of forgetting history, right? We have it in 2008, <laughs> right? AIG and CMOs, right? And, 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 uh, and long-term capital, right? I mean, we have a history of forgetting how these, how the ripple effects, right? The, the butterfly effect really can really take flight in ways that we can't anticipate. So I don't know, this story's not over, I don't think by any stretch, right? Like, as you said, as, as people have to, as they have to sell positions to cover their, their uh, you know, their losses. And it's interesting because you exactly pointed out what I tell other persons in, finan in my financial planning process, which is that, you know, I can, you can hedge, you can get away from a single issue. But when, when correlations break down, what you presumed were uncorrelated, all of a sudden, you know, snap and everything goes together in one direction. Now you've got a problem that can turn into calamity. And that's, you know, the housing crisis, you know, CMOs, you know, the you know, mortgage-backed securities were not as un, nearly as uncorrelated as, you know, the rating agencies and the modeling and thus, you know, the big short, et cetera, et cetera, you know, would have suggested. And so now... Whether or not that same risk comes to this as a result of what looks like a single issue about GameStop or you know AMC, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure. I'm. It'll be very interesting to see. Yeah, the story's not over, and I think you know it, it, it's not the same story. But Bitcoin is a, li a little bit the same too, right? Where we have this frenzy around a an asset whose value is really hard to ascertain, I think. I, I'm still, it's, it's a puzzler to me um, why it's worth so much <laughs> other than, you know, just, you, you know, the, uh, the madness uh, of crowds. <laughs> it, that, that for me is slightly different because there are other technical reasons, right? I mean, there's the store of value, there's, you know, payment processing, you know, non-government fiat, but then again, then you've got whole extra risks. I mean, I have made comments on this, you know, privately, what's to stop a government from saying, okay, this is outlawed and we're now creating our own digital currency, period. <laughs> I mean, and then <laughs> you'd, you'd have a whole different, you know, regime. And there's not, I don't know what, you know, if the cryptos, how they will deal with that or what the price will, what would yeah, happen. I'm I'm that sure. idea. My, my biggest problem, I think, with crypto at the moment is that, you know, to, it's not necessarily a, I mean, it, it's currency in the sense that you can use it to buy and sell stuff, but it's not currency in the sense that it has the same value today as it did yesterday or tomorrow, right? I mean, I guess the dollar fluctuates against the euro, against the yen and, and whatnot, <clears throat> but the kind of swings that we see with Bitcoin don't exist. And so for me, it's really hard to think I'm going to buy a car or I'm going to the grocery store, I'm going to use my Bitcoin. And when I walk into the store, it's worth X. And when I walk uh, out uh, to the cash register, it's 20% less than it was when I walked mm. in. And I don't know how you can uh, create a currency around something that has that kind of volatility. And, and I saw this, I had this thought as well, as you know, you've seen these headlines where companies are putting their retained earnings, their, their cash balances into crypto in you know, big numbers. So how are you gonna value these companies? <laughs> I mean, one of their assets is going to be, you know, here's my cash balance. I mean, right now, you know, we look at Apple and you know, we know that they have this amount of money and they can cover their debt, you know, by six trillion times. 
well, what happens when their reserve on that part, that reported number on some earnings number, all of a sudden is subject to 20% a year volatility. That's a foreign exchange risk, you know, that they currently face, yep. but not to that volatility. It's going to be, how are you going to value the companies? Right. And, 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 and then, you know, add to it the sort of the taxes that come with Bitcoin, right? It's, it's, a, it's considered a property, so it's going to be, right, have uh, capital gains and capital losses. And, and so, you know, there's the added complexity of figuring out, especially at the individual investor level, I think. Right. <laughs> you know, For sure. For sure. You know, that much because it's not, uh, it's not like earning interest income on a bank CD. So that's enough of current event, our current events talk. Fair enough. <laughs> so, you know, a little clumsily as far as segue, uh, tell me about the street.com. So the reti retirement daily is fairly new, relatively speaking, not your work, but what you're doing at, at the street.com. Yeah, it's new, but it, it continues something I began in 2003 at Market Watch, uh, where we had launched a, a subscription newsletter called Retirement Weekly. Okay. And at, the, and at the time, in retrospect, thankfully, it was only published on Friday afternoons, and and uh, and I uh, and and along the way, what happened was the person who brought me recruited me into Market Watch was a very dear old friend who I worked with back in the late 80s, early 90s, a gentleman named Dave Calloway. Uh, he and I co-wrote a column together at Boston Herald in the late 80s, early 90s. And, um, and then fast forward to the 2000s, he was then editor in chief of um, Market Watch. And he asked if I would come over and start uh, a newsletter that would focus on uh, retirement. And, and, and thus Retirement Weekly was born. <clears throat> and then uh, fast forward uh, a, a decade plus, and he becomes the editor in chief of USA Today, and he, that and he recruited me to write re about retirement for USA Today, which I started doing. And then fast forward a few years from there, he became the CEO of the Street, and he uh, recruited me to start writing about retirement for the Street and to launch another subscription newsletter, which we dutifully had to rename something other than. <laughs> Retirement Weekly, so we call it weekly. Retirement Daily, and we launched it in, I think it was April of 2018, if memory serves, and, um, and, and now we publish daily, and the interesting thing along the way is Dave is no longer CEO of The Street, he's moved on, uh, the company was bought by a company, The Street was bought by a company called The Maven, which also owns Sports Illustrated, and uh, the Maven has a, a different business model. And one of the things that they did was that we created, uh, we produced Retirement Daily. Uh, uh, we switched it over from a subscription only newsletter mm. to a newsletter that ha is, has content in front of a paywall and also content behind a paywall. So we're publishing today uh, in the new format uh, about 10 to 11 articles per week. Uh, about five of them written by professional financial advisors, um, half of them written by me. Some of them are videos where I interview. I mentioned Jeffrey Levine. We, you and I do videos about right. uh, Medicare and healthcare related topics. Uh, we take questions from readers. We have a feature called Ask Bob. We published uh, every so often uh, a curation of all the retirement related research that I've found on the internet published by places like uh, Wharton or Boston College or, or Michigan. They have a retirement research center there at the University of Michigan. And, uh, and it's been great. I think one of the things that we pride ourselves on is the, the fact that we're uh, putting on display the knowledge of financial planners about topics like Roth IRA conversions or Medicare or Social Security. And I think we're filling an unmet need out there, when, which is interesting because when I think back to 2003, when we launched Retirement Weekly, one of the, the premise was that there were 70 million people marching, 77 million people marching toward retirement, and none of whom necessarily knew where to turn to for good guidance and education and knowledge and wisdom. And so uh, we didn't have to capture all 77 million of those people, uh, but we just get a small fraction of those those folks in terms of readership. And, and that's how it began. And what's interesting is one of the things that happens is I, I like to refer to it as just-in-time learning. 
Uh, so every year, three to five million people turn 65. Right. They go on Medicare. Right. And, and, and those three to five million people didn't think about Medicare or Social Security 10 years ago. But, but in the moment that they do have to think about it, they, have, they consume as much information about it as they can possibly get. So every year, I, I kind of get a new batch of three to five million people who are interested in uh, at least specifically Medicare and Social Security. IRAs are constant, Roth IRAs are constant, 401ks are constant. But every, each and every year, there's a new sort of group of three to five million people who do a deep dive on the thing that they need to know before they claim Social Security or apply for Medicare. Well, you're, it's funny you were saying that, you know, that the, the 70 million people and you don't need to capture them all. You know, crazy people write books about, you know, <laughs> on, the, on, on the same, on a very, very, that, 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 that premise sounded why very, very familiar. Somehow. You're not calling yourself crazy, are you? <laughs> well, it's been, you know, exactly what you had said. And I think we are probably, you know, in agreement, why, probably why we're able to, you know, continue on with each other, you know, so regularly, right? We know that People have put it on the back shelf or you know back burner, et cetera, et cetera. They know that there's something, and, and you know they're you know next to my star saying here, you know that's that's why I also have the little statue there because you know that's the elephant in the room, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah. it's just you know you know you know you have got these topics <clears throat> that people don't know about. They kind of have heard the lingo maybe or. Well, now on Medicare, they turn on the TV for five minutes and you get a, you know, you get a commercial and stuff like that, but certainly into your site. And so years ago, you know, the baby boomers weren't yet here. How did Bob Powell get involved? In I mean, this is even before, like you said, you were talking about a long time ago at the Boston Herald. You know, this was kind of, this has been kind of your niche. How did you get to that niche? All right, so I'm going to try and make the story short as possible. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, uh, I don't want to. What's the Steve Martin routine? I was born a no. <laughs> right. Uh, so actually, it, it begins in some ways um, uh, around 1984. I, I wow. graduated college, and my first job out of college was I was working for a pharmaceutical uh, company. And uh, after four years of doing that, I decided that I wanted to change careers. I I I it was a, a great career, but I, mm. but I, um, my options were kind of um, unappealing, shall I say. Um, so I, I read the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? Uh, at the time. Right. And I completed all the exercises in the back. I'm probably the only person in the world that's ever completed all those <laughs> exercises. And at the end of that, those exercises, I re I, I, the, the two options for me were become a journalist because I had been writing by night for the four years I was in pharmaceutical sales. Okay. And, and or become a stockbroker. And so I investigated uh, both those options, very different options, as you might imagine, right? Sure. And uh, one of the things I learned along the way was that journalists were, were not very well paid and stockbrokers were. Okay. <laughs> so I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to become a stockbroker. And I did, I went to work for Dean Witter Reynolds uh, uh, in 1984, from 1984 to 86. And I was part of what has been described as the Dean Witter Reynolds experiment or the Sears experiment. Right, right. Sears, right. Sears owned Dean Witter. They owned Allstate. They owned Caldwell Banker. I was in an all rookie office in White Plains, New York. And uh, once a week, we had to go to the Sears store in Stanford, Connecticut, in the basement next to Allstate and Caldwell Banker with a little green banker's lamp on my desk and a little chart showing what the Ginny May rate were, was that day and what the uh, CD rates were and whatnot. And, uh, and I, I tried to be successful as a stockbroker for two years. I did a variety of things. I tried to sell the company's asset management to pension plans in like Westchester County and Fairfield County. Uh, I, I tried to sell um, uh, 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 bankers' acceptance notes to the oh, treasury wow. departments of uh, Fortune 500 companies by, by day. And then by night, I would cold call using the Coles directory uh, trying to get folks in Darien and Greenwich and and uh, and whatnot to you know buy municipal bonds or buy IBM stock or whatever, and uh, the, and the truth of the matter is I'll give you two stories um, about how bad I was at this. <laughs> <laughs> is anyone really good at calling on the telemarketing? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I you know it was a, it's an interesting so so two stories. One is 
uh, you know, I'd be calling someone in, in Fairfield County and I'd have the, the analyst report that said IBM was a buy. IBM was, as you may recall, is headquartered in Westchester County in New York. Right. So there were a lot of IBM folks around and a lot of people who cared about IBM. And I'd call and say, oh, our, our, our analyst, Joe Smith, is, uh, has a buy recommendation on IBM. Would you like to buy 500 shares or, or is it 100 enough? And the people would say, um, uh, yeah, that's great. It's a, there's a buy. Are you sure it's going to go up? And I'd be like, well, you know, it beats the heck out of me, sir. It's a stock. It could easily fall in value. You know, it's, <laughs> right. a, it's a risky asset. Right. <laughs> what, what do you want from me? I'm not a, you know, I'm not, I can't read. You don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. So, you know, of course, that didn't make, make help things. That I couldn't tell, you know, just one side of the story. Right. And then the other is, this is my favorite story about being a failed stockbroker is that I was in the Sears store one day and a gentleman came in late uh, in the evening um, and he had just sold his house. He was in his 60s or so and he had come into the most money he had ever had in his entire life and he wanted to know what to do with it. So I spent the next hour or two explaining to him the investment pyramid and safety of principle and liquidity and risky stuff. And we talked about everything from money markets all the way to, well, at the time, if we had Bitcoin, I probably would have talked about Bitcoin. Right. And then all of a sudden, the lights go out in the Sears store. It's, there's complete darkness except for my green banker's lamp. Right. And um, we never, he and I, because the door was closed in our little office, we never heard the announcement that the store was closing. And we were, in effect, locked in the Sears store. Oh. Him and I. <laughs> right so we had to call the stanford police oh, no. department which oh, no. then, then called the manager of, of the sears store to come down and un unlock the door and uh you know the next day i'm telling my uh, branch manager this this story and he wants to know how it turned out that i closed the sale <laughs> No, 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 no. I mean, if you can't close a sale when you're locked in a store with someone, right? Talking about a captive audience. Right? And I said, you know, um, after we got done, he said he was going to, he, he really appreciated all I had to say and that he was going to take his money to the bank where he had his, you know, savings and checking account and, and just leave it there. So I never made the sale. And, uh, <laughs> so, and that so was it, huh? That was it. That was sort of, now, the interesting thing was, by day, I was doing stock brokering. By night, I was I was starting to fulfill my desire to write. And I started I writing. I wrote for Connecticut Magazine. I wrote for the Westchester Business Journal. I, I started, you know, enjoying writing. And I started enjoying writing about money, which is sort of like how it came to pass. That And, and I, I thought, this is my, these are my two loves. I love the market and I love writing. And so in 1986, I pivoted. I went back to grad school. I got a master's degree in journalism. And then I began the long, slow climb up the journalism ladder. I worked for the Berkshire Eagle, the Boston Business Journal, the Boston Herald. I went to a company called Dalbar, where I was the ed uh, editor and publisher of a um, stable of trade publications in the mutual fund and uh, annuity industry. And, uh, and then from there, it was the year 2000. And the, as, you, as you may recall, 2000 was one of those um, great years in the market, right? Money was flowing in, right. companies were being launched, right. venture capital companies throwing money around. So I, I left the, the company where I was as editor and publisher of the trades to uh, launch an online education company. And uh, we were successful for three years. Uh, we went through several rounds of financing. We mm -hmm. launched the Boston University online CFP program. Um, which is, I'm still very proud of it. It's still uh, in existence. And, uh, but along the way, as each uh, new venture capital company injected money, um, what we found was that the founders, myself included, uh, were being sort of shoved aside. Right? I see. <laughs> it was, uh, and then one day, uh, it was a little bit of out with the old and in with the new. And, uh, you know, they, they, one of the interesting things was the last round of money that came in, the folks were like, you know, this is great that you've built this product, but you, but you haven't sold it. And um, we said to them, well, you know, we have a marketing plan. We just need money to execute the marketing, the sales and marketing plan. The, the, and the reason we don't have sales is because we spent all our money building out a really good product. And, you know, you might say that was foolhardy, but we now have a product, that, and that, a product that people want to buy. We just now need to execute the marketing plan. Anyway, that, <laughs> and they said, okay, well, well, we'll do that. And thanks for building out the product. And they let go of like almost everyone who founded the company, except for a couple of people. So in 2003, I was on the outside looking in without a plan B. And that's how I came to pass that 
Dave Calloway and I reu reunited that I see. market watch. And, uh, and he said, you've been writing about money and personal finance. And he, and he said, you know, what, what do you think is next? And I said, well, Ken Dykewald says <laughs> that, uh, that baby boomers are the biggest market in the world and we ought to be writing about retirement for them. So I, I also, so I credit Ken Dykewald too for being the, in, the inspiration for me pursuing retirement almost exclusively. And at this point, what's next? I mean, you're going to keep building out retirement daily. Well, and also, you were kind of fortunate, right? I mean, you never know, right? Because obviously, the local newspaper, et cetera, doesn't have you know resources at this point. You know, with the you know newspapers, are there any even big top big city newspapers are not in good condition at all, really? Yeah. So, and now you're here in the digital world. So you've kind of one half step ahead. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, the, the, I don't know what the next step is. Uh, Retirement Daily is, is a good platform. It allows me to do lots of things that I couldn't do on my own. I'm able to, to produce videos. I'm able to produce podcasts. Uh, I, I think one of the things I want to do is, um, is create a library of retirement uh, webinars. Um, where we we have a you know just a complete and and have it be a complete library of educational webinars about all things retirement. So I think that's one. The the other is um, I, I I and actually my my former colleague from my days at the online education company going back to the year two thousand. He's he left and went on to found and and uh, several companies that he's he has sold to various yeah. entities like the Washington Post and Google and Microsoft and on and on. He's become a serial entrepreneur. He came to me a year ago to launch something called Finstream.tv. And the thought is, I think if you say what's next is everyone's in love with streaming right now. Yeah. Right. And uh, and he said, you know, I think we could create a streaming channel focused on personal finance and to have a, a, a channel that offers everything to everyone from whether you're Gen Z or the silent generation, whether you're just starting graduating from college or you're at the tail end of caregiving or, or, or needing care uh, or whatever your topic might be, whether you're you know, uh, male, female, black, brown, uh, you know, young, old. And so we've been slowly over the past, I'd say six to eight months, uh, posting videos onto finstream.tv. We're now on Roku and Fire TV. And how does that even work? I mean, how do they, how do you access that? So if you were to go on to uh, Roku and search for Fo Finstream uh, TV, you would find, you know, uh, several uh, long form and short form videos that we've produced so far. And our hope now is we're in the market looking for sponsors for, um, for, con for our content. And what we're aiming to do is to sort of build our business on three uh, core principles. One is create original content. Uh, two, curate good content. We know that there's a, uh, a lot of folks out there, you know, building content, yourself included, uh, where we can curate that content and-, and My content's bad, Bob. I mean, I got this face, I've got this horrible, <laughs> horrible mid-mess mumbling, so. <laughs> well, I'm not, a, you know, I'm, I'm hardly a pro at this, but uh, as you've seen, people, lots of people have been successful on video. <laughs> that, 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 fair uh, enough. You know, <laughs> Ch uh, Chet and Dave, right? So, so, uh, so that's, uh, you know, so there's original content, curated content, and then sponsored content. There's a number of entities that, uh, commercial entities, academic entities sure. that are publishing good content as well. So, so it's been a, you know, I, I do that in addition to everything else I'm doing. And, uh, and at some point, you know, maybe it's the only thing I do, though I have to say, I'm, I'm the kind of person, I don't know if you've ever done a, a, a Colby assessment of yourself, but, no, but I, no, I, I, anyway, it's an assessment that, that sort of says what you're good at doing and how you do things. And, and I like launching things. If I had to sort of say, what's the one thing that really gets me up in the morning is, is launching things and getting things up and going and, you know, trying new things. And so this to me is exciting. I, I, I don't know if it'll be the only thing I do once it gets up and running. Cause I, I also like variety. I like being able to work for different people um, and, and like, and work and, you know, I'm at this stage of life and I don't know if this is true for you, but I feel like uh, I'm, I'm old enough where I really just want to work with people I like working with and on things I like working on. 
I'm always afraid of those self self assessment things. I'm afraid the result will be like you're no good at anything. <laughs> 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 you know, or like you know that's why i need to take myers briggs and stuff like that and i was like yeah <clears throat> and you read the four letter combinations like yeah this is like some scary horrible person like what are you like yeah <laughs> well, I, I I my I changed my answers along the way with that I know, in mind i know i know <laughs> it was, it was odd. I, I guess the colby in some ways confirmed what i already knew about myself yeah. so <laughs> And that's the other thing, right? Is, is, are, are people like gaming it? So like, okay, well, I wanted to say this about myself. I don't so I'm know. Answer it in something in this way. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I I don't know. I uh, but but it is true that I like launching things, and uh, and it's funny when I worked at Dalbar. One of the I, I've had two big influences in my life that I want to share with you, Jay. One is when I when I first started out of college, I worked at Marion Labs, which was founded by Ewing Marion Kaufman, and I don't know if that name rings a bell or not, but I've heard uh, the name. Yeah, so today there's the Kaufman uh, Center for Entrepreneurship in Kansas City, Missouri. Ewing Marion Kaufman had also owned the Kansas City Royals as well as Marion Laboratories. He was, in, to my way of thinking, one of the greatest entrepreneurs I've ever had the luxury of working for. And uh, I learned, I mean, not that I worked directly under him, but just the philosophy that imbued the company was you couldn't miss it. And and to this day, I'm thankful that that was like my first job out of college because you really got a sense of how someone could build a company, make everyone involved in its success, everyone care in its success, everyone share in the wealth of its success. It was really remarkable. You know, in fact, Marion Laboratories prior to Microsoft had produced the most millionaire employees of any company in the history of the United States. Hmm. And, and had I stayed, I probably would have retired at age 30. Um, I, you know, it was, it was that, it was that lucrative. Um, and my father always yelled at me for leaving the company. He called me a damn fool, I think, for, <laughs> for, for uh, you know, exiting the company, but you couldn't have paid me any amount of money to not to do something I didn't quite enjoy at some point. The other entrepreneur I worked for was a guy named Lou Harvey, who ran Dalbar, which was the mutual fund research and publishing company that I worked for from 1993 to 2000. And uh, Lou was a classic entrepreneur, very different company, maybe 10 million in sales, 70 or so employees. Uh, but Lou sort of um, worked a little bit like you and Marion Kaufman uh, in some ways, in some ways not. Lou was always the kind of guy that would say, whatever rules are in place are subject to be broken. <laughs> and, and then he would say things like, um, uh, whatever I said yesterday was true yesterday, but might, might not be true today. And so you had to operate in this atmosphere of chaos in a way, because he was, he was always sort of trying to, he, always, he was always trying to do one of two things, either meet the needs of the market, which he was very good at, or anticipate the needs of the market, which, uh, which he was also good at, but the success rate there was much less because you sure. just had to, you didn't always know, right? And I was always the person who had to execute the one out of the, you know, try to figure out which of the 10 things right. that anticipated the future might work. And that was mm. fun for me because I got to sort of like be at the cutting edge of what we were doing and what the market, you know, trying to lead the market to a place we thought it was going to go. Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the phrases I like to say is, you know, there's create creativity out of the chaos. Absolutely. Yeah, and he was he was great at that. I mean, we had truth be told, we had high turnover because not, not everyone can work in an environment. Oh, sure, like that. sure, right. Not right. everyone is built that way to to get the creativity going from right. you know from you know they just see the chaos. Right, and I thrived in that environment because I thought it was exciting to sort of just see what what's next, you know. And that's sort of like what the news business is. The news business is like what's next, All right? You walk in to in the old days, you'd walk into a newsroom not knowing what you were going to write about that day necessarily. At your place or if you're sitting on an umbrella, you know, your people go to retirement daily, they, but they're going to the street.com and getting some persons from there. So does that mean you're interacting with the rest of the way the entire platform works or it's just kind of you stand alone, you're the captain of a ship in a <laughs> fleet? So, so I get to be the captain of retirement daily. Um, and then when it comes to the street proper, I work with an editor um, and we're posting retirement stories and personal finance and investing stories there. You know, the, the interesting thing about the street is it's largely driven by, you know, it's, it's, it's largely driven by Jim Cramer, right? That, I mean, he founded the company. Right. 
And much of it is around investing and much of it is around, I think, real time investing opportunities. And which is, which is interesting, you know, from my perspective, people might come to the street to get that kind of real time investing news. And then they stay for retirement, right? Because one of the things that happens is everyone loves the thrill of investing, but, but you're investing for a purpose. And oftentimes the purpose of investing is to build a nest egg for retirement. So it's a, it's a great match in many respects because uh, the investing draws people in and the retirement content keeps them there. It's going to be interesting to see because, and I think part of this Reddit, you know, if we go back to the GameStop, et cetera, is that, and you had mentioned your children, which is, you know, people like us, you know, we wouldn't necessarily build financial literacy matters or financial fluency matters. You know, not, I don't think have done a very good job of reaching out to, you know, the 30 year olds of the world. Right, it's the stuff isn't appealing, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or you know, unless they're pulled in by force, you know, some other meaning, some something has you know required them to do so. But to get them up to speed, it'll be interesting to see whether or not you know the, this saga, you know, the fact of you know Robin Hood and you know younger generations, you know, in involved in, in financial markets and whether or not that leaks into other financial topics or if it just kind of stays over there as I'm kind of, you know, glorified buy low, sell high, hopefully exercise. And that, yeah, guess- so I'll, I'll share this with you. One of the things I get to do at Retirement Daily, I mentioned experiment. So I, I forged the relationship with the Financial Planning Association. They have a next gen community, a community of age 40 and younger financial planners. And uh, there's 2,500 of them in the organization. And um, we created a relationship where I now have these folks, these under 40 year old financial planners starting to write about non-retirement related uh, issues for that audience. So on Retirement Daily, we know that um, a full 50% of our readership is under age 55 and about one in five is 25 to 34. And that's uh, a and lot so- higher than I would have thought. It really is. It was a surprise to me. That so they're coming, very they're coming surprising. Forward, like how to invest my 401k. And so my philosophy now has been, okay, you came for retirement. Let's give you other stuff. So I have these financial planners writing for me now from FPA Next Gen. Haley Talitsky is one of them. CJ Miller is another. And there's 18 others that are in the stable who are writing right now. Um, how do I buy my first home? How do I buy an engagement ring? Um, uh, how do I create a budget? So we're now creating personal finance content aimed at I'll call it, you know, I call them next geners, but uh, they're really Gen Z and, and young millennials. Um, and we're getting some traction there. People uh, seem to, uh, we're getting page views. So for me, the experiment is starting to work that people do want to know. Again, so much of it, I think, Jay, is also just in time, right? I'm buying my first home. What are some mistakes I need to avoid? Or I'm getting engaged. How do I go about doing that? Or, you know, I, I, I use Mint, but I really don't know what the heck I'm doing with it or something. You right, know? right. So, uh, so I think I, I'm hoping that we'll tap into this, this growing need on the part of, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned my children, they're 25, 22. Um, we did a piece on what are the elements of your, uh, your credit score and how can you improve it? And I have to say that before I even did the piece, I was talking to my kids about this. They knew more about credit scores at age 25 than I ever did, you know, really? even at age 45, right? They, because of, I'll call it the, because of YouTube, right? They've been able to go out and figure out, you know, length of credit history, payments, right? No, whether you have, uh, how many cards you have and when was the last time you applied, all that stuff. They, they knew all of it. They and they said how to me, it what, worked. Right. And they and they said to me, you know, I can't get my credit score any higher until I've had a longer credit history. And so like that's like, I'm like, I kind of scratched my head thinking, wow, I, you know, they didn't come to me for that. They, they didn't come to me to learn how to tie a bow tie either. But that's OK. I, <laughs> but they went and, and found the information that they needed to improve their credit score. And I you had to applaud them because, um, you know, they could have easily gone through life not knowing that. That's actually an interesting fact because, and a surprising one, but yet after you've described it, the information's out there, if it's kind of, you know, curated and put into a place where someone 
can access it. And it's a good, excellent point about the fact that it's, you know, just in time on demand, that type of thing. So, yeah, in fact, I, you know, one of the things I don't like doing live webinars because I think it's really hard to schedule people to come. Right. To, I totally agree. Yeah. Right. I just assume record it and post it and let people come watch it when they can. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll Bob, I've enjoyed this. And before we get, you know, to, oh. before we go to a second hour, et cetera, et cetera, we can talk <laughs> about so many other topics. But again, it's the street.com retirement daily. There'll be a link in the podcast as well as video form, et cetera. Bob, it's been great to work and talk with you. You know, we've, we've always talked about, you know, our little interview questions or exchange emails about the quote that you'll use, you know, in your articles. And thank you so much for your support of the book and things like the, of Maximize Your Medicare. But, you know, I've enjoyed today. Thank you, Jay. I've enjoyed it too. And, um, and, and, and I think I've exhausted all my stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. And we will talk again soon and look forward to working with you, you know, on an ongoing basis. 